Hello, everybody. Welcome to the site event, Partnering to Educate the Ocean Science Leaders of the Future. This is a site event within the framework of the High Level Political Forum at the United Nations. My name is Omar Hernandez. I am a public information officer at the United Nations Academic Impact. We are an initiative housed in the Department of Global Communications in the UN Secretariat, and we align institutions of higher education with the goals purposes and principles of the United Nations to realize the future for all, for mankind, particularly within the framework and considering the sustainable development goals contained in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And in that sense, it is our great pleasure to co-host and co-organize this event with our very own UNAI SDG Hub for Goal 14, the University of Bergen in Norway. This, is, this will be an excellent opportunity to harness the expertise of so many people around the world and to hear firsthand from the experts about what role new universities and colleges have in fostering education for the future, particularly in a scientific topic as relevant and as important these days as that related to the protection of our oceans and seas. And it is my great pleasure again to welcome all of you from all around the world. Uh, we have seen people participating from literally all corners of the world, which means and implies and the great importance that people all over the world gives to this interesting topic. And with that, and without further ado, I would like to introduce the moderator of the event, Professor Edvard Bidin. He is a professor at the University of Bergen, director of the Bergen Pacific Studies Research Group, the Science Advice Platform on SDG Bergen, and the international research project Island Leaves Ocean State, Sea Level Rise and Maritime Sovereignties in the Pacific. Professor Vidin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar. I'm uh, sincerely grateful to the United Nations Academic Impact uh, for co-hosting this side event with us today, um, and also for being um, such a shining example of uh, forging ever new links between university-based science and uh, the United Nations on a truly global scale. Okay, ladies, um, gentlemen, colleagues and friends, wherever you are in the world, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that uh, the world needs to be ready for whatever comes next. We must prepare for more, oftentimes unpredictable, interactions between humans and nature. Where can we look for solutions? In the ocean, maybe? The ocean, for there is only one, uh, is still the least explored part of the planet. We often say we know less about the ocean than we do about the moon. Still, ocean literacy uh, appears to be uh, low among both policymakers and ordinary people alike. This may also explain why uh, it's often said that SDG 14 is among the severely underfunded ones uh, of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We need more science and knowledge on the ocean, and clearly it must be disseminated widely. How do we get there? It is not enough just to strengthen the funding of uh, ocean science. To raise ocean literacy and awareness of what the ocean has and what it can give us sustainably, truly path-breaking approaches are needed. One starting point might be to uh, strengthen ocean education in schools in uh, new and interesting ways. Another one is to train new types of ocean science leaders for the future. And finally, new forms of partnerships are vital to raise global awareness of what the ocean hides and what the ocean may provide. Using the UN uh, Decade of Ocean uh, Science for Sustainable Development as a backdrop, uh, in this side event, we wish to explore connections between uh, SDG 4 on education, SDG 14 on the ocean, and SDG 17 on global partnerships. How can more ocean research and educating the ocean science leaders of the future lead to a sound implementation of SDG 14? How can we engage diverse forms of knowledge from the local to the global? How can global partnerships strengthen ocean literacy? Now, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce today's keynote speaker, uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy on the Ocean. 
Ambassador Thompson needs no more introduction, I think, but I might add that he is, in fact, also an honorary doctor at uh, the University of Bergen, our own university here in Norway, and that for seven years he was Fiji's ambassador to the United Nations, in which capacity he worked with all the 38 small island developing states, or big ocean states, of the world to bring SDG 14 into being uh, a core element of the 2030 agenda. Now, we give the floor to Ambassador Thompson, who has kindly provided us with his pre-recorded talk. Greetings to all gathered with us today, and many thanks to the co-sponsors for organizing this event in the margins of the UN's high-level political forum. The distinguished panel assembled for this event is going to be delving into the fundamental connection between science, ocean literacy, and funding SDG 14. And I greatly look forward to the outcomes of their interaction. I'm both honored and delighted to be making the opening remarks on this topic. This is particularly so because in the course of our task of implementing Sustainable uh, Development Goal 14, to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources, it's become increasingly obvious that ocean science must be the foundation upon which the achievement of SDG 14 is built. Is that foundation firmly in place? No, it is not. The majority of the ocean's properties remain unknown to science, which is an astounding situation when you consider the ocean contains the majority of life on this planet and produces over 50% of the planet's oxygen. It's for this, these uh, reasons that the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development was mandated by the UN General Assembly, giving IOC UNESCO the task of leading us through the decade. The IOC has carried out a superb job of preparing us for the UN Decade of Ocean Science through a series of regional meetings around the world, and the much-anticipated decade has now been launched. The course is set, and we are underway on the voyage to provide us the science we need for the ocean we want. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're discussing here today falls squarely within the goals of the Ocean Decade. And so for anyone listening to my words who is not familiar with what the Decade seeks and offers, I urge you to get involved. In the years ahead, we'll have some very important decisions to make about our relationship with this planet. And we'll need to make those decisions on the basis of the most trustworthy and comprehensive scientific findings available. Thus, with the ocean covering so much of the planet's surface, Full scientific knowledge of its properties is absolutely necessary, and for this reason alone, the decade assumes existential importance for us all. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to mention something that has affected my personal thinking on these matters. The subject of the anecdote I'll give you is Prochlorococcus, sounding rather like an exalted senator of the Roman Emperor. Uh, this tiny marine critter, Prochlorococcus, is in fact the smallest photosynthetic organism that we know of. And there are a billion, billion, billion of them in the ocean, producing 20% of the oxygen within our planet's biosphere. The existence of Prochlorococcus only became known to science about three decades ago, which is incredible when you think that life on this planet would be very different without it. After I became aware of Prochlorococcus and its vital contribution to life, two things occurred to me. The first was, what else is there in the ocean that is vital to our lives that is still unknown to science? With somewhere between 50 and 80% of the ocean's properties unknown to science, you may take it as a certainty that great marine discoveries remain to be made. Ladies and gentlemen, I find that to be far more compelling and relevant to my grandchildren's lives than navel-gazing over whether life exists elsewhere in the universe. The second thought relates to our connection to all things big and small, a lesson that was rammed home to all by a tiny coronavirus called COVID-19. This may sound trite, but what a profound moment it was when I realized my vital connection to Prochlorococcus. All times previous, I'd been blithely unaware of my reliance on this little creature. Coming from a volcanic Pacific island, ringed by a mighty coral reef, I'd always treasured my place within nature's bounty of rainforests and tumbling streams and coral lagoons. But in my ignorance, I had overlooked how it was microfauna, phytoplankton, bacteria, 
and all sorts of minute life forms that were keeping us all alive. The logical conclusion to thoughts on our connectivity with all things is that we must stop destroying the biodiversity that maintains life on this planet. In our own selfish best interests, we must cease our pollution of atmosphere and ocean or be prepared to suffer the bitter consequences. As UN Secretary General Guterres put it in his address to the Blue Cop in Madrid, we are willfully destroying the life support systems of this planet. Ladies and gentlemen, that self-destructive lunacy has to end and end fast. Ultimately, the well-being of the ocean will determine the future viability of humankind. The reasoning behind that assertion rests in the underlying, underlying scientific findings supporting the oft-repeated maxim that the planet cannot be healthy without a healthy ocean, to which must be added the warning that the ocean's health is currently in decline. So that assertion is part of a worldwide call for increased political will and greater attention to science as we approach the all-important UNFCCC COP26 in Glasgow this November, particularly with reference to curbing anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. As we all know, the latter are the common enemy of biodiversity loss, climate change and the decline of the ocean's health. COP26 in Glasgow has been described as the last best chance to turn humanity away from the unsustainable and therefore self-destructive path upon which we are currently set. It is therefore incumbent upon us all to raise ambition for the outcomes of the Glasgow COP. Ladies and gentlemen, in their communal wisdom, the Member States of the United Nations gave the next UN Ocean Conference a theme that is centred on science, innovation, solutions and partnerships. The conference will be held in a year's time in Lisbon, at a time when the voyage of discovery of the UN Decade of Ocean Science will have been well underway. With science as the flagship, powered by the renewable energy of innovation and partnerships, I am confident the solutions the conference seeks will emerge and that we will thereby be in a position to make the right decisions for our future security. Ladies and gentlemen, if I ask myself the question as to whether policymakers and the population at large are aware of the urgent need for action to reverse the decline in the ocean's health, I get a mixed response. Having been amongst those who fought for SDG 14's place in the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, I can say with a high degree of confidence that the first UN Ocean Conference held in New York in 2017 significantly raised global consciousness of the need for action. But when it comes to ocean literacy, we have far to go. The first principle of ocean literacy is that the world has one big ocean with many features. This is fundamental to our correct understanding as it overcomes human mindsets that imagine we can carve up the ocean or ignore the effects that melting Greenland ice sheets have on sea levels flooding Pacific islands. And yet how often we hear policymakers and others who should know better refer to our oceans rather than the ocean. And if this is evidence of low levels of ocean literacy in high office, should it be of any surprise to us that SDG 14, our best hope of reversing the decline of the ocean's health, is the least funded of the SDGs. I once spent a day in Bergen, brainstorming with good colleagues at the Institute of Marine Research. The outcome of that day for me was a mantra that I've carried with me since. Science leads to planning, leads to finance. The mantra is a reminder to me that when I'm asked for the keys to unlocking finance for the sustainable blue economy, the answer you must apply for funding on the basis of demonstrably sound marine spatial plans and that they themselves must be based upon the very best of science. And so for us to have the science we need for the ocean we want, ocean literacy and ocean science will have to become integral to our education systems around the world. As Nelson Mandela put it, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. That integration should be occurring right now from primary school education up to the highest tiers of our tertiary institutions. In that regard, permit me to mention two examples in which I am pleased to play a minor role. I refer to the unique interdisciplinary PhD program, NPOC, under which the long-term partnership of the University of the South Pacific 
and the University of Bergen is supporting 24 young talents enter the critical field of the climate ocean nexus. Last month, I was happy to see this program included in the first call of IOC UNESCO's Ocean Decade Actions. And then there's the One Ocean Expedition, an 18-month circumnavigation of the planet by the tall ship Statsrad Lemkul. Let me first declare my interest, for along with the uh, Norway's Prime Minister, Erna Solberg, I'm honoured to serve as an ambassador for this expedition. One of the key components of the expedition will be the interdisciplinary science and education on board, bringing together global university partners, the University of the West Indies, the University of Cape Town, the University of the South Pacific, and the University of Bergen. Partnership, innovations, solutions, and science. I look forward to seeing you all on the road to Lisbon. Our thanks to Ambassador Thompson for so well setting the stage for today's uh, discussion. As a Fijian, as a global citizen, as a true ocean man, he has already provided us with a wealth of ocean topics and uh, ocean partnerships. Now, uh, before we continue, just a quick housekeeping detail. We welcome questions from the audience uh, throughout the side event. They can be placed in the chat and do not hesitate to provide your names when posting questions. Note that the chat is moderated so that any questions asked during the keynote and opening statements from the panel may not show in the chat until the Q&A session begins after the panel. Uh, so my dear audience, uh, to further build our ocean uh, conversation, we now have an extraordinary panel to offer you. Coming in from uh, Longyearbyen, the city of the long year in Svalbard, Norway's faraway Arctic outpost, Cape Town, Bergen and Trinidad. They also represent three universities that share some solid relationships and partnerships within ocean and climate networks in which uh, the speakers themselves are key actors. Uh, I give them uh, a quick presentation in the sequence in which they will speak. Uh, welcome to all of you panelists. Uh, you will shortly be uh, uh, giving your talks. Professor Lise Evroos, our first speaker, is a professor at the University of Bergen's Department of Biological Sciences. She's also the scientific director uh, of Ocean Sustainability Bergen. Lisa is committed to science for sustainable ocean management and to educating the new generation of leaders in this field. She chairs the UNESCO and International Association of Universities Global Consortium for SDG 14. She is a member of the Science Advice Group of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters and is Norway's representative in the European Academy's Science Advisory Council. Her research concentrates on climate change impacts on cold environments, particularly in the Arctic. Therefore, she is presently on fieldwork in Svalbard. Next, we have uh, Professor Isabel Ansog, who's an observational oceanographer and the first female head of uh, the oceanography department at the University of Cape Town. Her research interests lie in Indian, Atlantic and Southern Ocean dynamics, including the Arctic Circumpolar Current. We also know that she is passionate about the shipboard training of postgraduate students from all over South Africa as the mastermind behind, behind the Seamester Floating University program. Isabel is a member of the Scientific Committee on, Arctic, uh, and on Antarctic Research and the Vice President of the International Association for Physical Sciences of the Ocean. Then we have uh, Dr. Natalia Gallo, who is a postdoctoral researcher here at the University of Bergen. In the Department of uh, Biological Sciences, she's also an affiliate of the Bjerkne Center for Climate Research and the SDG Bergen Initiative. And Natalia came to us from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California, and her research focuses on climate change impacts on deep sea marine ecosystems. She's a member of the Early Career Ocean Professionals Working Group under the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. She's also passionate about the science policy interface, using science to support sustainable ocean management and getting students and early career scientists involved in this process. Finally, from Trinidad, we have Dr. Stacy Richards Kennedy, who is the director of the Office of Global Partnerships and Sustainable Futures at the Regional University of the West Indies. Stacy has a long career in development management and finance. 
is on the board of the State University of New York, University of the West Indies, uh, Center for Leadership and Sustainable Development in New York. And she co-chairs the International Steering Committee for the establishment of a Center for Excellence for Oceanography and Blue Economy at the UWI Five Islands campus. Stacy chairs the UNESCO International Association of Universities Global Consortium for SDG 13, bringing together universities from across five continents. What a fabulous lineup of speakers we have. Welcome, all of you. First, to the far north, up there in Longyearbyen, the city of the Longyear, Professor Evros Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Edward, for this nice introduction, and also thank you for inviting me to be part of this highly esteemed panel. Uh, as you already pointed out, I'm at the, when, when I'm not in the Arctic doing field work and teaching new generations, I'm uh, the scientific director, director of Ocean Sustainability Bergen, which is a virtual center on ocean research at the University of Bergen, Norway. University of Bergen is Norway's biggest university, marine university, and marine research and education are one of the three prioritized focus area at the university. Our university is also highly engaged in the 2030 agenda and have taken a national lead on this among Norwegian university. So our scientific expertise and engagement in the 2030 agenda process led to a recognition by the United Nations system and thus, UIB was chosen to be the lead institution on SDG 14 Life Below Water, or the International Association of University Higher Education Sustainable Developmental Cluster in 2018. Also in recognition of research, innovation and scholarship undertaken in support of the SDG 14, United Nations Academic Impact welcomed also the University of Bergen as its hub for a sustainable development goal 14 from 2018 to 2025, 21, sorry. And last month, we got a renewed recognition for the time 2021 to 2024. So through the Virtual Ocean Sustainability Bergen Center, the university has taken on a leading role, not only nationally, but also internationally on the work to promote knowledge and understanding of a sustainable ocean. So the center takes care of the day-to-day -day activities in relation to our university status as the hub for SDG 14. At activities we are running are webinars on emerging SDG targets, such as 14.1, reduce marine pollutants, and target 14.2, to protect and restore the ecosystem, among others. We are also in the phase of finalizing a joint publication with IAU on higher education engages with SDG 14 life below water. Well, we have invited universities and experts worldwide to contribute to this publication. Our aim is to finish this in due time and get this out and published to our network and collaborators. We are indeed using this international network to promote research collaboration and to detect science gaps and focus on the science policy interface. Another important network we're partnering in is the Ocean Teacher Global Academy training courses, the OTGA, hosted by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Committee. This is a global network of regional and specialized training centers delivering training on ocean science, service and marine and information data management relevant to the IOC programs and contributing to the United Nations Ocean Decade. This year, we held a summer course together with Bergen's Summer Research School on UN Sustainable Development Goal 14 in June. This was due to the pandemic, an online course, and it was very well received by the course attendants. As, Professor, uh, as Ambassador Thompson also mentioned, the University of Bergen is one of the partners in the One Ocean Expedition, which is an 18-month circumnavigation bus south of Lamkul where it will be interdisciplinary science and education on board. During this expedition, our researcher will study the ocean and we will share knowledge about the ocean cruiser role for a sustainable future. We will have young ambassadors on board on the journey and we will educate 90 students on board for four months. We will also provide a course on SDG 13 on climate. These courses are open to students from all faculties at the university plus other selected partners and universities worldwide. 
Then I would like to mention that we also just started the Norway Pacific Ocean Climate Scholarship Program, the ANPOC, which is an ambitious and interdisciplinary partnership in research and PhD training between the long-term partners University of Bergen and the Regional University of the South Pacific. This is indeed a unique interdisciplinary PhD program where 24 young talents focusing on the critical field climate ocean nexus. Last month, this program was included in the first call for IOC UNESCO Ocean Decade Nexus Long Time Partnership. Finally, I will also inform about a new interdisciplinary CS fellowship program that will run for the next five years. In this program, University of Bergen will be training a new generation of marine research leaders and decision makers to ensure sustainable oceans. This prestigious co-fund award from the European Union's Horizon 2020 will impact the University of Bergen and our region for many years to come. Nearly 40 experienced researchers will be hired and they will be linked to different academic environments at U University of Bergen and to partners in business, administration and collaborating research institution at home and abroad. The CS Fellowship Program is thus a very important investment that will shape the direction of our marine research right now and in the future. So I think this gives an overview of the activity we're doing, focusing on this, uh, this topic that we will discuss today. Thank you, sir, for starting off the panel uh, so well with us uh, <laughs> and for giving uh, such detail on partnerships, all kinds of partnerships for SDG 14 and uh, wider uh, issues. Now, um, I'm pleased now to uh, give the floor to Professor Isabel Lansorg in Cape Town. Over to you, Isabel. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I just checked that everybody can hear me. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. It's a huge privilege to be able to talk a little bit about the research that we're doing in South Africa and how we're trying to connect with, with a much broader community within South Africa and Southern Africa. And incidentally, we had a few students from the University of Bergen um, join us on one of the cruises in 2018. So I've been head of oceanography since 2016 at the University of Cape Town, and we have a very strong observational oceanographic um, community. We have access to an incredible research resource, which is a, a sort of a brand new polar research vessel, the S.A. Gullis II. But over the years, I've, I've become very much aware that this is something that's very much a privilege to many of us uh, within a small community. But South Africa is bigger than just one or two universities that have access to this vessel. And since 2016, as the head of oceanography, I, I made it a, um, a, a sort of a goal to actually open up the resources that South Africa has, the marine resources, to a much wider uh, university network. In South Africa, we are 26 universities, but traditionally, between six and seven universities have access to the, the very five-star platforms that we have, um, which allow us to do uh, ocean research. So in 2016, what, I, what we put together was a floating university. It was an opportunity for students from all over South Africa, from every university, and there are 26 universities, to actually apply in a free, free and fair process to participate in one of these floating programs. Now, these university um, programs are every year, and they work on about a 10-day uh, research cycle. And we take about 46 students from all over South Africa to experience life at sea. Because one of the things that I realize is that without these tangible experiences, without some sort of uh, network to the ocean resources, without actually being able to do the work, to be able to get your hands wet, quite often students don't really uh, or are not able to connect the dots. What they learn in class and what actually happens in collecting your ocean observations is might be in two very different boxes. And so an opportunity to go to sea enables a student to be able to go from the classroom to the deck side and to be able to understand the challenges it is to get ocean data. Now we're in a very, very rich ocean data environment. We have huge ocean models and climate models that are 
spinning huge data sets out at the moment. And it's very difficult for students without actually some sort of tangible experience to really understand what that data means. How do we visualize the data? How do we interpret the data? And so time on board a vessel is really critical, I believe, in creating the next generation of marine scientists. But we know that ship time is very expensive, it's very limiting, and it's, uh, it's, it's very rare that an entire country has that free and fair ability to, to apply to such a program. And so in 2016, when we started Seamester, we opened up to the country, to all the university students studying some form of earth system science, whether that is looking at mangrove swamps off the uh, east coast of South Africa, whether it is doing GIS measurements on the west side of South Africa. These were students that really want to engage with lecturers from all over South Africa, gain some sort of hands-on experience working with marine, oceanographic and biological equipment. And so we started Seamester. Every year we take 45 to 50 students from all over South Africa and we take about 30 lecturers. And these lecturers are experts from marine geology all the way through atmospheric climate modeling. And during a 10 day research program, these students spend about three to four hours a day in, in the auditorium where they learn classroom theoretical marine science. And then they apply that to deck based work. And it's only by linking the two are they really able to understand the difficulties in marine um, in marine sciences in collecting that data, the challenges that we face, whether it is from very difficult ocean environments, whether it is to malfunctioning equipment, whether it's to shifts in um, just your ability to work at a 24-7 hour um, program. And it's been such an incredible uh, experience and such an incredible journey for us uh, as, as scientists and as lecturers to see these young students come on board with no experience, having some of them have never left home. This is the first time that they are on the most incredible research vessel that South Africa has. And here they are finding themselves within a new community of young, engaging scientists. And these are the next generation. And if we can't en enthuse this generation, if we can't inspire them and that they learn from the older generation how to uh, apply the theory that they learn in the classroom to the hand, um, hand, hand held, hand based um, research, then I really believe that we are not doing our jobs. We need to allow these students to really develop and in doing so create the next generation of marine scientists. And it's something that I, I really cherish because when I was 13, my parents took me out of school for a year and put me on a, a, a sort of a sailing vessel. And up until that point, I never wanted to do anything in the marine sciences. But that one experience is something that really changed the direction in which I've taken. And it's because of that experience that I have moved into oceanography. I've studied over the years. I now sit as the head of oceanography at the University of Cape Town. And I really believe that creating experiences, creating learning um, platforms, uh, the ability for students to engage in a wide variety of lecturers, professors, academics, experts in marine ecology, marine biology, oceanography, uh, atmospheric chemistry, all these wonderful disciplines in the marine and earth systems. It's only then can we really generate this new generation of um, extraordinary marine scientists. And uh, yeah, that's just a little overview of the work that we're doing in South Africa from a floating university perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel, for um, this, this inspiring talk. It, just as if it was coming out of the ocean. <laughs> it was really, really <laughs> fascinating. We, uh, we now move along and uh, return to Bergen, uh, where Dr. Natalia Gallo is waiting, uh, although not with us here in studio. She is actually in her own uh, office. Natalia, the floor is yours. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, again, it's a real pr privilege to be a part of this panel and also thank you to all of the audience members who are joining us today. Um, I'm actually going to pick up right where Isabel left off talking about the next generation. 
uh, because I'm on this panel as a representative of the ECOP working group. And so ECOP stands for Early Career Ocean Professional, and we're a group under the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And the main goal of the ECOP working group is to ensure and promote diversity uh, throughout the actions of the UN decade. What does that mean? That means that we create training opportunities, we create opportunities for engagement with uh, students and uh, people who are early in their career. So an ECOP is somebody who has less than 10 years of professional development. And so the goal is to really make sure that we're providing these training opportunities, these engagement opportunities, so that when the decade is over in 2030, uh, you have created the capacity to continue um, with the goals and the vision of the decade. So the ECOP working group was first founded in June 2019. It was uh, quite small to begin with, and so now it has grown. Um, there are over a thousand members of the ECOP working group um, representing participants from over a hundred countries. Uh, and in June 2021, it was recently just endorsed as one of the official UN Decade Actions, which was really exciting as well. So how are ECOPs involved in the UN Decade? Um, I would say that ECOPs are, are involved in pretty much every aspect of the UN Decade. So uh, there was an ECOP present at the first Ocean Decade Global Planning Meeting. That was Alfredo Giron. He was the one who actually proposed that there actually needs to be an ECOP working group because there was a very low ECOP representation at that first planning meeting. Um, since then, the ECOP group has contributed to commenting on the initial implementation plan of the decade. We have contributed to um, presentations during the Ocean Decade virtual series. There was a really successful 24-hour virtual ECOP event that took place after the launch of the UN Decade this June. Um, also, ECOPs are involved in organizing and leading and also evaluating Ocean Decade laboratory submissions and satellite activities. Um, and there's also an excellent uh, ECOP Ocean Literacy Task Force, which is also working to promote and raise awareness about uh, the ocean um, in the broader society. And so one of the things I really wanted to talk about is how we can make sure that the educational framework that we have in universities actually supports training this next generation of ocean leaders that we really need to have in order to support the goals of the decade. And if we see what are the goals of the decade, if we look at that plan um, and we look at why a decade is even needed, why is the ocean decade needed? One of the main problems is that ocean science capacities globally are really unequally and unevenly distributed. So we really need to make sure that we engage better um, we also need to make sure that we're generating ocean science that's fit for purpose. We need to make sure that we are training students with interdisciplinary research techniques. Um, we need to make sure that the ocean science community is actually engaged and aware of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we need to make sure that research is uh, developed in a participative, participative and transformative process. Um, so, in a way that actually brings together scientists and policymakers and managers and service users and a number of different types of professionals who engage with the ocean. And so my big question is, if we look at traditional strategies of education, um, especially in uh, the geosciences and the ocean sciences, are they actually designed to train that type of ocean leader that the UN decade really needs? Um, and I would say that most often not. Uh, most often um, classes are very specialized and very disciplinary, and we do a really great job of training students to understand problems. I mean, our universities are excellent at that, but when we really get to looking at problem solving and thinking about greater societal components of those research questions, there I think students are not really uh, engaged in that way in the classrooms, and that's where we're really missing out. Um, and I think it also uh, detracts from the types of students who continue um, in the kind of in the STEM workforce and in the ocean workforce as well, um, because there are a lot of students who come to um, to the sciences wanting to make a difference, and uh, they don't really feel like they can do that in the way that they're being taught in the classrooms. Um, and so when I was at Scripps, I had the opportunity to participate in a number of actual uh, policy meetings 
which really influenced my career. Um, Isabel was talking about tangible experiences and certainly being able to participate in the UN climate negotiations was a tangible experience that um, was hugely influential um, in everything that I've done since then. And so I think there's real value in making sure that students within universities are trained in the policy frameworks that uh, take the science that they are being trained to produce and actually teach them how that either succeeds or fails in the real world. Um, and I think another really great example of the value of these uh, kind of policy engagements is that Alfredo Giron, who was one of the co-founders of this ECOP working group, he also came through kind of the Scripps program, and he also had a lot of these um, firsthand experiences at these high-level UN meetings. And so it's clearly really informed uh, his career development as well. So I think there's tremendous value in giving students access to those experiences through the kind of traditional ocean science framework. Thank you, Natalia, for um, this wonderful talk on behalf of you, uh, ECOPS, Early Career Ocean Professionals. I'm wondering, and we can perhaps discuss this uh, later, what's the difference between a scientist and a professional? I hope all scientists are professional. But uh, to continue, um, our final speaker uh, is in Trinidad, where I'm sorry to say a tropical storm has been brewing, but uh, Stacy Richards-Kennedy, uh, you are with us now, and um, may I give the floor to you, Stacy? Thank you very much, Edvard, and greetings to everyone. Um, I wanted to start by thanking the organizers and particularly my colleagues from the University of Bergen for your kind invitation to participate in this discussion. And of course, um, warm greetings to all of the colleagues and distinguished panelists who are with us today. I'm joining, as you said, from Trinidad and Tobago, which is one of the 16 independent Caribbean countries within the UN SIDS network that comprises all small island developing states from the Pacific as well as the Atlantic, India, and South China Sea. And this discussion is of critical importance to the Caribbean because our region has one of the largest marine spaces in the world. With the exclusive economic zone of the small Caribbean islands far exceeding their land masses and with many of our countries in the region being primarily tourism based. So everything we do is connected to the ocean. I'd also like to situate my university within this geographic context. Um, the University of the West Indies is a public regional institution serving the Caribbean, and it is unique in many ways. It is one of only two regional universities in the world and was set up as a developmental university some 73 years ago. Uh, the UWI comprises five campuses, four physical campuses in Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados and Antigua and Barbuda, and an open campus that is dedicated to online education. So we have roughly 50,000 students and 8,000 staff members across our five campuses. And in spite of being a relatively young institution with much more modest budgets than other international universities, we are proud of the teaching and the scholarly contribution that our staff have made, particularly in the area of marine conservation, ocean science, and climate action. In fact, we were told by the Times Higher Education International Ranking Agency that it is the global recognition of UE's teaching, research, and advocacy that have positioned us among the top 100 golden age universities and among the top 2.5% universities globally for our work on the SDGs. And let me also recognize, as Lisa did, um, the International Association of Universities, which nominated the UWI in 2018 as the lead university for SDG 13 on climate action within its global cluster on higher education and research for sustainable development. And this enabled the strengthening of really important collaborations with several other universities, including the University of Bergen, which as you heard leads on SDG 14. 
So to achieve this as a university operating in a region that even before the pandemic was marked by high debt and low economic growth is no small feat. And this is why the nexus between science, literacy, partnerships and funding to achieve the SDGs is so very important. We know that as a global community, we can only achieve the targets we've set for SDG 14 through science and education. We know that ocean health and ocean governance require multidisciplinary responses and trans-border collaboration. So no country or region can do this alone. And therefore international partnerships that can support the much needed scientific research, access to the very costly specialized scientific equipment and laboratories, as well as science diplomacy that can support the science policy interface to move data and evidence to policy and action become even more critical. So how has UWI been advancing ocean science in the Caribbean? Well, permit me to share a few quick examples. At the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad, uh, Professor Judith Gobin, through a partnership with EV Nautilus and Ocean Exploration Trust, was able to participate on two occasions in deep sea exploration that enabled local scientists to explore for the very first time segments of the deep ocean off the east coast of Trinidad and Tobago, using ROVs and submersibles with camera attachments. And as a result of this marine expedition, over 80 new deep sea species were discovered, including a purple octopus, hundreds of thousands of other marine life, such as deep sea mussels, three foot tube worms, crabs, shrimps, snails, and fisheries that only live at roughly four to 5,000 feet below the sea, as well as deep sea methane vents and cold seeps and the amazing marine life that they sustain at these incredible ocean depths. At our Mona campus in Jamaica, the Center for Marine Sciences manages two marine labs in Port Royal and Discovery Bay, which are dedicated to research, education, and advocacy on marine habitats, biodiversity, and the importance of the linkages between coastal systems. Our researchers there work with national, regional, and international agencies on fisheries monitoring, up restoration of mangroves, ecosystem health, coral reef restoration, seagrass and sargassum projects. Over in Barbados, at our Center for Resource Management and Environmental Science, CIRMES, at the Cable campus, there, are a range, there is a range of graduate programs uh, and they conduct applied research in a range of areas such as tropical, coastal, marine resource management coastal dynamics, sustainable tourism, coastal and marine economic valuation, sargassum adaptation and management, and marine spatial planning. In addition to teaching and research and its application and policy advisory support to the Caribbean, UWI as an activist university engages with civil society organizations such as the groups representing the fisher folk and the fishing communities, as well as the hoteliers and the industry partners so that we can provide support and technical and scientific advice for community-based projects. However, as you know, deep sea exploration as well as the equipment and instrumentation for rigorous ocean research is extremely costly. And at the moment, all Caribbean countries are battling multiple crises. There's the climate crisis, the COVID public health crisis, and the financial crisis that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. So we are at a critical juncture where we urgently need to come together as a global community at the level of the governments, yes, but also the UN system multilateral development banks, international foundations, philanthropic foundations, and of course, our global network of international universities so that we can provide tangible support for each other. If not, what we risk 
is the unraveling of decades of development progress and the derailing of the prospects for achieving the SDGs. So a case in point is the funding for the participation of Caribbean students in the One Ocean Research Expe Expedition. Many students from developed countries are enrolled in fully fun funded graduate programs and already come with sponsors and have funding that back their participation. In the Caribbean, it's different. For Caribbean student researchers, they still need to secure the funding and we have been helping by knocking on several doors for some time. What we have heard though, and of course the pandemic has not helped, is that budgets are already allocated. The type of activity does not necessarily qualify. The amount in some cases may be too high, while in other cases it's below the minimum thresh threshold. And this can be disconcerting to student researchers who really want to get on with serious ocean scientific research. But we will not give up. We will persist. At UWI, we're committed and we will do all that we can to give our young researchers the opportunities to pursue the science that we need to have the ocean that we want for a sustainable future. So colleagues, today's discussion about how we partner to educate ocean science leaders for the future is very much welcome. We cannot achieve a healthy ocean without investing in robust ocean science led by universities in every region across the globe. And of course, let me congratulate the University of Bergen for its leadership in this area and for its advocacy in bringing committed partners together to advance SDG 14. I'd like to pause here and hand back over to you, Edward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stacey. Uh, I particularly liked your emphasis on uh, advocacy, activism, and uh, taking uh, uh, whatever repertoire of roles we can take in uh, also, um, shall we say, uh, addressing inequalities uh, in the way in which education and research are carried out. I hope we can touch on that uh, in the discussion as it, uh, as it unfolds. So, uh, dear panelists, uh, all four of you, dear uh, Lisa, Isabel, Natalia, Stacy, thank you so much for this, uh, what shall we call it, this mini marathon of uh, ocean passion and inspiration. Um, we have traveled across latitudes and longitudes on the screen, and uh, we have touched on uh, very many uh, concrete examples and uh, ambitious uh, models. We have also uh, heard uh, inspirational and challenging talk about uh, the both the practicalities and challenges of partnerships. I think we have uh, more than enough uh, food for thought for um, uh, a little while, uh, well, a little kind of uh, uh, initial discussion that I wish to to try and draw you uh, all into. Um, we are. We have a moderated chat. We have a few questions that are coming up now. I'm sure uh, all of you, dear audience, feel free to uh, post your questions. Uh, they can be to the panel at large or they can be to individual uh, panelists. But I wish to start uh, by posing a question uh, to all of you. And then uh, I will not ask for very long answers, but rather uh, little punchlines and uh, allow you to, uh, to uh, pitch some favorite uh, ideas and, and topics. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, and I'm particularly um, addressing uh, here the, the very evocative uh, uh, image that Stacy gave us of, uh, of islands in ocean. Uh, we have uh, these two uh, regions with populated ocean, if I may say so. We have the Caribbean and we have the Pacific. We have ocean states, uh, states with, with not very big islands, but with a lot of ocean. And uh, we also have um, a situation there where uh, perhaps the majority of the population are uh, everyday ocean observers. Uh, sometimes uh, we have been thinking that uh, local knowledge, traditional knowledge, the knowledge that uh, people who fish or gather shellfish or whatever have is anecdotal, but it's not. Uh, we know uh, that it's uh, very detailed. It's uh, certainly timed in to uh, the accumulated knowledge of, uh, of uh, perhaps uh, hundreds of daily close observation uh, 
uh, uh, close ocean observers who are continuously following ocean life, ocean health and ocean seasonal uh, variability. How do we accommodate this uh, type of uh, uh, knowledge into uh, a broader scientific agenda? Does anyone want to uh, have a go at that? Feel free. Natalia, you're nodding. Yeah, uh, I think that's a really good question, Edward. Um, I think that one way to address it is to make that um, students are aware of the existence and the value of that knowledge. Um, a lot of times we learn uh, through textbooks and we learn through scientific papers. And so we learn from kind of very uh, more, uh, I guess, more like a Western approach like uh, to uh, to science. And so I think very oftentimes students aren't even um, aware of the value and the amount of information um, that is held by uh, by stakeholders, by people who are out there on the ocean every single day. And so I think that the more opportunities we have to allow students to engage with um, with different groups and communities outside of just the academic sector, uh, the better off we'll be because a lot of times the solutions to these main really large ocean challenges require knowledge that's not just held by the academic community, but is of course held by these local communities that are out there working on the ocean every single day. And the only way that we get to the ocean we want isn't just by producing the science we need, is by working with those communities and both uh, understanding their knowledge and then making sure that the solutions that are proposed are actually uh, tangible and uh, work for those communities. So I think uh, increasing engagement, um, making sure that we're not just in an academic box when we teach students is key. Thank you, Natalia. Any uh, other comments on that in the past, Stacey? Sure. Yes, and with, I, this is a really critical area for us at UWI because of our role as an activist university. Our researchers, our students are very much encouraged to be uh, on the front line uh, applying the research and working hand in glove with our partners, with our community leaders and so mm -hmm. on. And in the area of SDG 14, what this means is really supporting citizen science and the practice of that public participation and collaboration in scientific research to increase local indigenous scientific knowledge. And what that does is it, that it provides opportunities for learning by doing through the experiential experiences, you know, experiential learning um, that is provided to our students and to our researchers. It helps us to um, also promote the valorization of indigenous knowledge and to um, work closely with the communities to build trust so that they, they understand what the university is doing in the community, in the service of development for everyone. And it also helps to increase that human agency, which we know is very important to, to be able to translate knowledge and ideas into practices and action that can help the environment. And so the underlying principle of when you know better, you do better is at the heart of um, development effectiveness, and it's at the heart of um, centering education in the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Mm. Thank you for that, uh, Stacey. I'm also reminded of a comment from, uh, from another side event at the AGLPF, the High Level Political Forum, when it was physical two, uh, two years ago, uh, when Fiji's uh, ambassador to the United Nations, Satyendra Prasad, said that, well, Fiji has about 900,000 people, but we have uh, tens of thousands of everyday ocean observers out there. Mm -hmm. is, uh, that is an approach to, yeah. uh, to reality, which I think uh, elevates uh, the everyday engagement of ordinary people with the ocean and, uh, and the mm -hmm. coastal environments into, into something different. Okay, Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. 
So we have a few questions that are coming in. Uh, some of them are uh, more practical and some are uh, related to uh, a specific responder here. Very simple one for you, Lisa. Uh, you have mentioned a fellowship. What was the name of it? I'm sure that uh, the question concerns the CES fellowship program. Okay, so that this program is, is a co-fund program funded by the European Union, and this means that we will have 40 uh, positions that will be for postdoc position that will focus on the marine science uh, across campus. So it was, will not only be natural science, but humanities and social science, etc., and law. So we will then have a huge effort on educating a broad group of uh, marine um, scientists for the next five years and this will also be co-funded uh, that's by the name by the uh, European Union and University of Bergen and also it will be very uh, tightly connected with industries and and uh, or, um, and companies in the region so this is really and it's a five-year project so this is a big big um, yeah investment for for the university and we really hope this will lift us even uh, higher on, on the competence that we have uh, on, on the marine uh, science. And of course, yeah. uh, we'd like to have applicants to that program from all around the world. Yes, it was it just uh, started uh, what we, uh, this this year, so we're now going to announce uh, mm. positions. So yes, keep, keep uh, looking for exciting positions in Bergen. And also, of course, in, in collaboration with our network, this will be kind of connected to all the activity we have going that I was presenting earlier. Thank you, Lisa. We have another question that has just come in, and I'm, uh, I think I'm sort of seeing it going in your direction, uh, Stacey, uh, although it is about Latin America. But, uh, but your region is closer <laughs> to Latin America than, than, than our other regions. And uh, the question is, what is the experience with interdisciplinary ocean-related projects? I'm sure that uh, you can get away with, uh, with a general response here in terms of the interdisciplinarity of ocean-related uh, projects here. If you happen to know any good example from Latin America, the, 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 the person who asks the question will be happy, of course. But uh, I think uh, the interdisciplinary question is, is the main one here. Yeah, sure. Um, so the interconnectedness of the SDG agenda, and of course, within SDG 14, the fact that there are so many disciplines that come into, you know, into play when we are trying to address the different targets um, related to ocean science and ocean health and ocean governance, that underscores the need for teams of researchers to work closely together. Um, within our own UWI, when we, um, we've been going through a process of a stock taking and mapping of the um, work that we're doing related to climate and sustainability and ocean and marine um, conservation and disaster risk reduction. And what we have found um, is that our, our researchers and scientists from across all of our faculties are involved in this very important work. It touches on the Department for Life Sciences, it touches on food and agriculture for the fisheries and so on, it touches on law for the, um, you know, the, the international maritime agreements and so on, it touches on the social sciences, it touches on gender and women and, you know, the vulnerable groups, it touches on engineering for the geospatial um, mapping and the um, GIS systems and really across the board. And so it's very important as universities that we provide opportunities and we encourage, we give incentives to research teams to work more closely together across the different disciplines because um, only by working in this way can we achieve the solutions that we would need and the types of innovations that need to come out to address these very complex and interconnected um, uh, problems or issues that we face uh, when it comes to uh, SDG 14. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, I think this is uh, really, really uh, a core question also in, uh, in designing uh, 
almost like a future plan for uh, knowledge about the ocean. Uh, it cannot be uh, mm. anything but uh, multidisciplinary, but ideally it should also be interdisciplinary. Yes. Uh, also mentioning here that in the chat we have a comment that uh, uh, losing the voice of the SIDS and the LDCs uh, at large in the decade uh, pr process will be, uh, will be uh, detrimental, will have serious impact in many ocean regions of the world, so we're mindful of that. But we have another interesting question now which I think uh, now uh, we can go to anyone of, uh, maybe it can go, go to you, Isabel, because uh, we've been okay. keeping, keeping you until now, but this is a, go a good one. <laughs> this is uh, Professor Sujit from uh, India. Uh, it's the uh, Christo Jayanti College in India, which is actually the um, UNAI uh, hub for SDG 1. Uh, no poverty. And uh, Professor Sujit mm -hmm. asks the following question, how can we contribute to SDG 14 since we do not live near the ocean? Uh, well, um, of course there's always going to be um, a lot of uh, input that people can, can give. So where, whereabouts are they in India? In the center or, or sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to get my base where, where the university is in India. It's a general question of, yeah. uh, of how can we deal with this when we don't see the ocean in a sense, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm, okay. I think it's a question about the global nature of the SDGs uh, and the particular nature of uh, SDG 14 as being uh, the ocean or life on the water. Okay, well, of course, it's, it's critical to always have an interest in any ocean um, uh, discipline. So whether it is your marine biology or your ocean economics or working with your coastal environment and regardless of where you live, it, there is an importance because of the impacts of climate change, the impacts of plastic pollution and the effect that it's having on our ocean resources. So I, I believe that wherever you are in the world, you should always have an eye out what's going on in, in the ocean environment and what man is doing in impacting the ocean resources, the, um, the impacts that, that the ocean has on um, weather systems, climatic systems, uh, plastic pollution, as I said. So I'm, I'm not really sure if I'm answering that question uh, very clearly, but I would imagine that at any point, wherever you are in the world's oceans, you should have certainly at that interest. Well, thank you. I, I'm also uh, mm -hmm. spurred by what you were saying here of, of, of these uh, global uh, physical interconnections. We know that the ocean absorbs large amounts of carbon emissions. We know that whatever takes place on land has consequences for the ocean. Do you want to follow that one up, Lisa? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, the ocean is, there's so many um, the ocean will be important in the time to come because we need to uh, get more knowledge for the, from the ocean. It probably will have more food from the ocean, more energy from the ocean. And this means that it needs to be a global effort in trying to understand this. But also, as Isabel was mm. mentioning, that the pollution, it's important not to up to, to keep a sustainable earth, the global earth. And we also see very much here in the Arctic that the terrestrial and the ocean is super intertwined and it's so connected. So of we really, really need to, to use the same uh, th way of thinking, whether you're in, in the Midland or if you're uh, by the coast. So I think it's, uh, and especially if, if yeah, ho to use also the knowledge in order to preserve the different ecosystem better. So what we also see uh, here in the Arctic is that often the seabird gives the clues to the ocean's health. So this is, everything is connected. Mm -hmm. And also in, in some of the Arctic uh, areas, when you have the melting of the glacier, the rise of the seawater, this would heavily also influence the whole ecosystem and the water transport system and the climate. So yes, uh, by mm -hmm. taking care of all the sustainable development goals that will also help on the SDG 14. Mm. And they're all inter 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 interconnected exactly. And uh, yeah. uh, mm. for those of you who don't know it, I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist uh, and, uh, and I'm uh, attracted sometimes to, uh, to uh, poetry. Um, but I think there is almost like a terrible poetry in, uh, in the predicament of the ocean in that it absorbs carbon, but it acidifies while doing that. 
So uh, the ocean uh, gets mm -hmm. more acid, uh, the more carbon it absorbs. And ultimately, we know what happens to coral reefs and other organisms that uh, cannot survive in an acid environment. Anyway, uh, another interesting question here. How can we help prevent ocean pollution? We do not directly throw wastes into water bodies. Hence, we have no full control over this issue. I think that's a clever question, right? Uh, what shall we do with, water, with, with, with ocean pollution? Uh, we, we take care of ourselves. We don't throw plastic bags into the sea ourselves, but uh, obviously someone else does. What is there to do here? Is that an ac activist question? Is it kind of a question about uh, responsible citizen behavior? Or, or mm. does anyone want to comment on that? Uh, can, yeah. I, I can Please. I can add something. Just uh, it's it's about better education. So one of the things that we do um, on our floating universities is we do a lot of plastic trawls. So we want to we want the students to understand that regardless of where you are in the world's oceans, you are finding plastic. Maybe you're finding different sizes of and different types of plastic, but it's everywhere. And of course, as you come closer to the coastline, closer to rivers, closer to populated areas, you do see a great deal more plastic. And one thing I've realized, showing the students, you know, doing the necessary net trawls, doing the necessary um, uh, laboratory engagements with them, they really sort of get a sense of shock over, over the, the amount of plastic that you find in the oceans. You know, you may not see land, but you can still see the plastic in the oceans. And I think almost it's like shock and, shock and awareness um, and that obviously will find its way, filtering its way to the next generation, to their communities, and so it goes on. So by educating, one hopes that uh, we see a better, um, a better control on, on the plastic that's going in. But of course, you know, there's governmental awareness, there are many other um, factors at play here. But certainly education is one of the, the, the kickstarts towards uh, raising that awareness and, and basically doing better as a society. Yes, um, education and awareness and uh, we have uh, almost like a possibility of going back in circles here to address some issues of, of education, training, how programs are put together and so on. I'm reminded of a quick comment that mm -hmm. Natalia made on the um, uh, well, maybe I overinterpret you, but you were talking about the greater societal contexts that are not so well addressed uh, always in, uh, in uh, uh, planning for ocean uh, research. There is a question from uh, uh, a friend of ours here, um, Rasmus Jetzer Bertelsen uh, from the University of Tromsø. What are the basic uh, social science and humanities research questions in your ocean science? What would you, as ocean scientists, see uh, is uh, are the core questions to be addressed from uh, social science and humanities? This brings us on, on to uh, really good potentials for multidisciplinary dialogue. So I, I give this to to uh, uh, those of you who identify as ocean scientists. Yeah, uh, sure. I guess I'll. Um... I'll attempt to answer that one. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the really fundamental social science questions is why do people's behavior change and why does behavior not change, um, right? And so that gets into that individual decision-making as well. Um, and uh, also to touch on the previous question, right? Why do systems change or why do systems not change, right? So that's a really important, I think, social science question. Um, I think understanding people's behaviors is absolutely fundamental uh, to being able to uh, enact the type of Did we lose you there or are you still on? Oh, sorry. Did it freeze on me for a yeah. second? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think uh, understanding people's behaviors is really critical to being able to get from just having good science to actually having a good policy and a good sustainable ocean management. Um, also understanding the history behind why we have the systems that we do uh, is also really important, I think, uh, social science component. Thank you for that. Any other takers for that one? 
No. Well, I'm thinking, uh, if I may uh, uh, contribute a little bit of, uh, I don't know, um, it is about uh, perhaps reorganizing disciplines as well, about perhaps not seeing uh, ocean science as somehow distinct from social science. I have the, an idea, at, or certainly a belief, or a, or, a, or a perception at least, that the IOCs, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission's concept of ocean science, uh, which was created for the decade, somehow embraces uh, a lot of different uh, lines of research. So maybe, uh, maybe social science, maybe law, maybe humanities are all part of uh, a new ocean science. I would think so. Maybe I, I could try and identify myself as an ocean anthropologist. I don't know. I, I like it in the ocean and on the ocean. But, but to uh, just test something here very quickly. I know you're on yeah. here, Stacy, very soon. But, but if I may try uh, something, um, there is a need to know more about what is in the ocean, right? Economists will call mm -hmm. that the supply side, you know, what the ocean has. But there is an equal need to know about uh, the demand side. Who, uh, who uses the ocean and how is the use of the ocean regulated? So we need to, the, the, we need to you know, integrate the supply and demand side. We need to integrate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lack of knowledge about uh, what the ocean has with the lack of knowledge about uh, what people do with the ocean. Which brings us on to another question that has come into the chat. But I see you, Stacy. You really want to say something now? Sure. I was going to come in um, to connect the dots between the last two questions because I saw them as um, linked in in some way. Because it is important to bring in and integrate all of the different perspectives as we look at how we address SDG 14, similar to how we address all of the other SDGs. Um, and so the role of humanities and social sciences and behavioral economics and so on in terms of shifting perceptions, shifting behaviors, all of that becomes really fundamental to the work of the ocean scientists and for different groups of stakeholders to understand each other as we work through this process together. It also connects to the to the point that Ambassador Thompson made in his keynote address about there being only one ocean. There is only one planet and it's not segregated by, division, by um, different regions, neither is it segregated by disciplines. So we all have to have that holistic approach and that um, you know, interdisciplinary collaboration if it is we're going to have an impact here. And so for the person who says, well, I don't put um, throw plastics into the ocean or I don't, um, I don't pollute, um, it, it isn't about whether it's your problem or my problem. It's our ocean and it's our planet. And together, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are informed, that we educate and that we um, uh, spread the information more widely so that there is um, that level of action, collective action towards this common resource that we need for the future of the planet. We have a lot of questions mm -hmm. coming in now. Thank you to all of you. And here comes one straight out uh, for you, Natalia, uh, because uh, this is about the young marine researchers. Um, how important is mobility for the students and young marine researchers? Uh, is mobility a way also to promote the exchange of uh, good and innovative practices? Pretty good question to ask in the time of COVID-19. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that mobility is important, certainly. Um, I think that having firsthand experiences and interacting with people in person uh, has uh, additional value to it, being able to, um, mm. so there is, I mean, you can't get the same experience virtually as being actually no. out at sea. I mean, there are really good parallels, like for example, Schmidt Ocean Institute has, you know, excellent broadcast ROV dives, uh, the EV Nautilus program. So there are certainly opportunities, but it's still not the same as being there uh, mm -hmm. in person. Mm -hmm. However, um, I think that COVID has taught us that we can function much better virtually than maybe any of us believed two years ago. Um, and so I think that COVID has provided opportunities where we can uh, work better together as a global network without 
requiring mobility all of the time. So I think we can reduce our mobility, we can build our local networks, we can build our global networks vi virtually. Um, and so I think it opens the door to a lot more engagement, especially mm -hmm. in communities that maybe don't have the resources to travel um, as much as yeah. well. Yeah. Mm. I, I think I could also add something on that. I, um, I think COVID has really taught us that, you know, we, as you were saying, we, we don't need to travel as much, but we miss the human contact. I mean, not being able to sit together in a room, I find is very challenging. Uh, you know, this sort of conversation is wonderful, but it's bitty because of connectivity problems and all of these things. But I think what is really important now are the very large conferences where which have been quite restrictive for students to attend, you know, unless they've had a willing supervisor who was prepared to pay for the flight and the registration, they would not be able to attend and they would not be able to see what was going on. So what I'm seeing now is that all these conferences are becoming hybrids where we have the opportunity to go there and be there in contact and interact with people, but all talks are now going to be online so that at any point, anywhere in the world, you will be able to connect with that, that speaker, with that session and to be able to ask questions. And I think we, we very quickly learned how to interact worldwide. You know, I mean, this sort of thing is incredible that we're doing this different time zones. I'm sitting here in winter, you're sitting there in summer. Um, and then we're doing it so easily and so quickly and so effectively, but it's still not the same. I, I feel we are really losing that human touch, that need to interact to, and, and to show your body language and to, you know, we're just seeing each other from here. Um, and you have, you have to have that. So I'm all for getting back on that plane and meeting people again, but I think it's been wonderful that we are now in a situation where all our meetings, all our conferences will be hybrids to allow people who can't attend uh, to, to be part of, part of these meetings. Thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, an interesting, uh, challenging question to, uh, to some of you here. Uh, this is, ocean exploration and research means we will exploit more from the ocean too in the future. How do we find a balance between the exploration and the sustainability? Lisa? Well, I think we need more knowledge. We need to know the system better. As we heard, I mean, there's so much we don't know. And uh, what I see from, I'm, I'm in the Arctic now, I'm actually teaching a course in the Arctic and uh, I have students on board. Um, and the Arctic is kind of understudied because of the dark season uh, where it's complete darkness. We don't didn't think it was a lot of thing going on. Uh, but taking the students out in the field to get to see what's going on and how you're measuring things is very important. So new knowledge is important. And also I think that the new knowledge, the new technology we have that we can measuring new things combined with the history and what, what was previously uh, also um, measured and known because there is a change in the global temperature. You have a climate change that affects the biodiversity and the migration of species, et cetera. So it's, you really need more knowledge uh, to be able to, to uh, harvest from the ocean in a, in a sustainable the way. And that, in that way, I also think, again, it's one ocean. We really need to collaborate uh, with, the, with different uh, parts of the, of the world to, to order, in order to understand how everything works together and also how to harvest in a sustainable way because it's... Uh, it's a local different mechanisms, but it's the same overall mechanism that is, is running this, the, the whole ocean. So there are several so questions. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, there, there, Sorry. Are, there are several, uh, were you finished? You can finish. Okay. There are several questions around this topic circling around. We have lots of questions in our, and I only have to apologize to, to uh, all of uh, those of you in our dear audience who do not get your questions uh, all the way through. But we are doing our best to moderate, and what, what we've seen is that several questions circle around this topic. Uh, and one particular um, uh, difficult question is deep sea mining. Because our ocean exploration is somehow also tainted with, uh, with uh, the scenario of deep sea mining from some perspectives. 
And you take Natalia, would you give Lisa a quick break and you say something about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, again, I think that uh, it's really important that when students are learning about the deep sea in the lab, they're also learning about the ongoing BBNJ negotiations because uh, there's a really important treaty being negotiated right now, which uh, will specifically deal with how biodiversity is treated in the international oceans outside of the EEZs. And I think uh, very often students don't get that information um, within their science classes when they learn about the deep sea, for example. Um, and then when they have that information, they, they can engage on those topics in, uh, in new ways. Um, and I think that, first of all, one of the things that we benefit from as an ocean science community is that we can learn uh, the, the lessons that we've learned from land. So there, there are lessons that we can learn about how not to proceed. Um, and we can think about being more conservative in terms of how we especially um, think about um, engaging in activities in ecosystems that we know even less about. So certainly um, making sure that we have good baseline data is critical. And then making sure that scientists are actually at the table, those, uh, those scientists who have spent their career studying these ecosystems, that they're at the table when these decisions are made about advancing mining interests in these ecosystems. Well, thank you for that. We are sort of coming uh, much too rapidly towards the end of, of this, and we have many questions that uh, I'm uh, sorry to say will remain unanswered. But we have a particularly important one now coming from uh, Lekni Aubert. She's eight years old, eight years old, not 18, eight years old. And she asks uh, the following questions from you, esteemed uh, older uh, people. I'm eight years old and interested in protecting the ocean. What should I study when I'm older? Marine biology, social science, or politics? Please give a good piece of advice for Lakeney of eight years. Okay, anyone? This can Marine go, biology. This can go around <laughs> the panel, you know, and you can only <laughs> answer with a few words. Oceanography. <laughs> okay. I, I would say, okay, sorry. Um, I would say um, study your passion. So if your passion is to make a difference and it's something in marine environment wise, um, oceanography and marine biology, you know, are normally quite uh, sort of hand to hand and, and uh, you know, to study marine biology, you need to have a good understanding of oceanography. And I would always go with your passion. What is driving you? What gets you out of bed? And um, yeah, that, that to me is important, is, is the passion, the, the emotion that you have is, is a wonderful thing. Okay, uh, Stacey, what's your advice for Lakeney? Well, I, you know, I agree that we have to be driven by that, you know, that passion. And um, so since what we're talking about here touches every discipline, as we said earlier, you can you can contribute to protecting our oceans and preserving the planet from from any vantage point. What is important is that um, you are driven by passion, by purpose, and that you have that um, thirst for knowledge, and through knowledge, you then can, can translate that knowledge into action. Indeed. Uh, Natalia, you have a few words to add? Yeah, all three of those topics are needed. Um, <laughs> and so follow your passion, and we will work really hard to make sure that uh, when you come up and you figure out which of those professionals you want to be, there will be room for you um, in the ocean community uh, working to improve the state of the ocean. Yeah. That's absolutely wonderful. And I think uh, through this uh, little round that we just had, um, and I say this because we're getting close to, uh, to the end, I have perhaps already now given uh, you that promised opportunity of a one minute, uh, it was slightly less than one minute, but a pitch for your own uh, 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 passion and interest. And I think we have a, we have a passionate set of, uh, of uh, comments to look back on now during the past uh, two minutes. And um, it is very difficult for me now to do what I have to do, which is basically take account of time. Uh, we could be here for much longer. Uh, we could just hang on here and we would have a fabulous conversation until uh, late night in Bergen. 
uh, and you know we could do that, but we have to end uh, here. Uh, some of the questions that have come in are direct, are very important uh, for specific uh, panelists, and we will see to it that perhaps some of those questions can be forwarded, and we'll 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 see what we can do. Uh, also, uh, uh, now note that. Um, the recording of this side event will be made available on the University of Bergen's uh, Vimeo uh, channel and uh, UNAI's YouTube channel. So it will be available, uh, not the Q&A though, uh, not the, all the questions. But it is time for me to, to uh, just say to you, uh, dear panel, dear panelists, dear Stacy and Natalia and Lisa and, and Isabel, you have been absolutely uh, fantastic. Thank you for uh, exploring ocean science, ocean literacy, ocean education and ocean wonders together. And thank you for our far -flung, to our far-flung audience for being here with us, all of you 200 plus today. We will know later where you come from and we will be uh, extremely enthusiastic to, to know more about those dimensions. Uh, let me also extend my gratitude now to uh, the backstage crew from our brilliant uh, digital event organizer, Bergen Live. That's a good uh, name for a company. And I might mention that Bergen Live's uh, record of live events, in addition to uh, us, includes the Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, and Bob Dylan. Uh, they've done, all of them have been customers of uh, Bergen Live here in Bergen. Uh, so we trust them completely, and I think we can safely agree that they have operated uh, our global event flawlessly. Thank you, uh, Bergen Live. From the studio in uh, Bergen, Norway, then, thank you all of you for being with us today. There's only one thing that remains to be said, and it has already been said by uh, many of us. There is only one ocean, and it is ours to share and safe keep. We might be well advised to heed the words of uh, distinguished Pacific Islands uh, thinker, scholar, and intellectual explorer, <laughs> the late Professor Epeli Haofa of Tonga. We are the ocean. Thank you.